Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this flaskup.com Mr. Pandaria raiding guide. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the heroic mode version of the Fallen Protectors in the Siege of Ogrimmar raid. Now, in order to complete this fight, you're going to want to bring two tanks, two to three healers, and then the remaining a mixture of both melee and ranged DPS. Now, being a heroic mode encounter, you should assume that all of the normal mode abilities that have been moved across, which is quite a few, this fight is very similar to the normal mode encounter will do pretty much the same thing, just deal more damage or cause you to, you know, use more cooldowns. So you need to keep that in mind throughout the fight. This guide's also going to assume that you do understand most of the normal mode abilities, as we don't want to recap every single one. But if you don't, then feel free to click on the annotation on screen in order to view our normal mode guide. Now we're just going to split this guide down into three sections and look at the three different bosses, what's new and what's changed, and then hopefully tell you how to kill them and gain epic loot and a shiny achievement. First of all, it is worth noting that the bond of the Golden Lotus is still active, and this means that you have to bring Rook Stone Toe, Heath Softfoot, and Sun Tenderheart all down to 1% health or 1 health simultaneously. Again, if you leave them to cast a bond of the Golden Lotus, then they will restore 30% of their maximum health, and it will kind of mess up the end of the fight for you especially since the DPS requirements are fairly high, I guess, on the Hero Mode version. But, you know, that'll change with gear. So, first of all, we're going to take a look at Rook Stone Toe, and his first ability that's changed ever so slightly is his Corrupted Brew. And in the Heroic Mode version of this encounter, every time he's casted Corrupted Brew twice, its travel time will be reduced by half a second. And this effect will be reset when Rook has entered a Desperate Measures phase. So you'll get your Desperate Measures phase at 66 and 33% remaining health. And in between them, every two times you cast Corrupted Brew, it will decrease on its travel time to the target location. So obviously this means the longer you have between the Desperate Measures phases, the harder it's going to be for you to move away from where Corrupted Brew is going to land. It's just something you need to keep in mind. The damage it deals is quite high, but if there's nothing else going on, you can kind of heal through it. But if the player's got like debuffs on them or gouge on them from he soft foot, then there's a very high chance that they are actually going to die. Now the next change, which is the biggest for Rook Stone Toe, is his Desperate Measures phase and the way that the three different adds, the Misery, Sorrow and Gloom, actually work. Now you'll still need your off tank to pick up the Embodied Misery and take it to the outside of the raid in order to make sure the defiled ground is being cast away from the raid and it's not going to hit any of your generic players. With the Inferno Strike from the Embodied Sorrow, we put down a purple world marker and this was kind of a generic stacking location. We made sure that people that have cooldowns such as Ice Block, Bubble, Dispersion or Deterrence if you're a Hunter, any of those kinds of damage reducing abilities were soaking the Inferno Strike on their own. And they need to keep in mind that this will deal 1.2 million fire damage. So you need to make sure that if you do have a cooldown, it's a very substantial cooldown and it will reduce that damage to something suitable like 400k. If you can't do this, then we just had someone call out stack up and then we stacked up on purple, apart from the person that had the Sharseer on them currently from Sun Tenderheart. And then the damage was just split between us and then we AoE healed everyone up fast. You should also keep in mind that while this Inferno Strike is going off, you'll also have the Calamity going off from Sun Tenderheart. And they kind of can line up badly at times, like you'll get a Calamity, then an Inferno Strike. So you do need to be awake when it comes to healing. And the third mob, the Gloom, with his Corruption Shock ability which is interruptible, should be interrupted at every possible time. And what we found best was to set up an interrupt rotation so that we knew it was going to be interrupted and there were going to be no casts of it because it deals a lot more damage. And if you have the corruption shock on you, along with all the other abilities that are going off, it's just going to cause unneeded deaths. You can normally set up a rotation of around three or four players in order to make sure the corruption shock is interrupted. Now, what's brilliant about these three adds in the heroic mode version is that they have a new ability called Shared Torment and even though it's a new ability it actually benefits your raid greatly because it means the Misery, Sorrow and Gloom share a health pool. Yes, brilliant, that's what you like to hear. 
So this means that at all times, all you have to do is attack one of the mobs and all three of their healths will go down at the same time. We found it was best in order to make sure that everyone was attacking the Gloom, just like we did in normal mode, we killed off the Gloom first. But we're going to stay on the Gloom for the entirety of this Desperate Measures phase in order to make sure that players aren't missing interrupts and don't have to keep on target switching in order to interrupt as it can be considered a DPS loss. Now we're going to move on to take a look at his soft foot and how you should deal with him. And he's not got any new abilities per se, he's just had a few kind of changes slash damage increases to two main abilities. The first one being the lovely Mark of Anguish. Now in normal mode what you might have done is someone got a Mark of Anguish and then they went, oh I'm going to give that to a tank. The tank can just take all that damage whereas I can't. But on heroic mode you do not want your tank to get the Mark of Anguish on them ideally as it will reduce their armor for 80% for 4 minutes. And we found that we, we did try this a little bit, we tried passing the mark to our tanks for the entirety of the phase and the 80% reduced armor is kind of a big deal. They can take so much more spike damage and it lasts for 4 minutes so it just ends up causing unneeded tank deaths. So again, what we did, if you think back to, if you did Raden Heroic, um, we had a kind of, if you think back to the Vita ability I think it was called, we had a rotation set up and players would pass the mark between each other and take the damage from the mark of anguish and gain the debuff until it was killed off. And this is just because players with 80% reduced armor, it's not too much of a massive deal. You just need to keep in mind that abilities such as his Garot ability, which deals ticking physical damage to players, will tick that little bit harder so players might need spam healing a bit more. So yep, we set up a rotation, um, you want to be using as many defensive cooldowns as possible to make sure that you don't run out of players to actually pass the mark to. I think 4, 5, maybe 6 or 7 stacks of the debuff on you is kind of a safe number to go for, but don't risk it. Play it safe and pass the mark on when you know you're going to start taking high amounts of damage and communicate with people, make sure you know who you're going to pass it to who's had it last and who's going to get it next, who's currently got it, all of this kind of helps you out and healers can be aware of who needs kind of spot healing or who needs to be healed up the most because they've got the mark on them. It's also ideal that if you spread yourselves out at quite far parts of the little arena where you fight the fallen protectors because the mark mob does have to travel to the players as and when it is passed. It's not going to move very slowly but it does buy you a little bit more dps time when he's not actually attacking players and then it means that you can have the mark moving around freely for a little bit longer it's just the little things that help you kind of output more damage onto it while your raid takes less damage now the next and final change that's happened to he soft foot is his master poisoner ability and this is where he will place either a noxious poison or an instant poison on the tank or at least that's what it was in normal mode in Heroic Mode, the Master Poisoner abilities will also take effect when using Garot or Fixate. So this is when he Garot's players randomly in the raid. If his weapons currently have the Noxious or the Instant Poisons on them, then players need to make sure that they're reacting to these abilities as and when they happen. So if you get Noxious Poison on you, you need to make sure that you're moving out of the pools on the ground. And if you have the Instant Poison on the weapons, you don't need to worry too much because Garot only hits you once and then he jumps back to the tank. But this will also cause his weapons to inflict additional nature damage. So you do need to kind of be aware of that. That will be if he fixates on a random player. If your tank fails to manage the gouge ability properly and turn away from him and get knocked back and that kind of stuff. The stuff that you looked at in the normal mode then it can become a bit of a problem and players will end up dying. And finally we're going to look at the third and final Pandaren who is Sun Tenderheart. And I'd kind of like to take a look at all of this boss's abilities because even if some things haven't changed, changes to other boss abilities may affect you while you're fighting Sun Tenderheart in, for example, her Desperate Measures phase. And conveniently, that's what I want to speak about first. So, with the Desperate Measures phase, when she enters the Dark Meditation, so to speak, and creates the 
protective bubble over her and you take 35% less damage, etc, etc. You need to be aware of a few things. Mainly the corruption kick from Rook Stone Toe. Now what we did is we made sure we positioned ourselves at the edge of the circle closest to Rook Stone Toe because when he casts the clash and then the corruption kick he meets with the player halfway so if you're standing fairly close to him you then have more room to move back whereas if you're standing on the opposite side of the meditative I guess that's a word bubble the protective bubble and Rook's on the opposite side to you he's then going to move into the center of this bubble and then cast the corruption kick which deals a lot more damage on heroic mode and it's going to end up killing your raid because your healers won't be able to put up with the damage that he's outputting to everybody. You should also be aware of what I've just mentioned on the he softfoot side of things as well in the sense that he could potentially spawn the poison pools underneath people if he has the poison on his weapons and he then randomly grows a player. That's just something that you need to react to as and when or as and if it does happen and make sure you're not dying to stupid things. Now, her three abilities, some Tender Hearts, three abilities kind of work the same in Heroic as they do in normal mode. Just as with everything else in this fight, you need to make sure you're managing it better. So her Shahseer ability didn't deal much damage in normal mode, deals quite a bit in Heroic mode. And it can also cause issues, for example, if you're stacking up uh, for the Inferno Strike from the Desperate Measures phase of Rook's Stone Toe. You'll have one less player to kind of stack in and split the Inferno Strike damage if they've got Shahseer on them. So it does help to have this ability interrupted. It is a bit of a pain because you need to make sure you're interrupting the Gloom's Corruption Shock. So you, you again, need to react to the additional damage that players will take if one person can't stack up. When Sun Tenderheart casts her Shadow Web Bane on players, you need to make sure this is dispelled as soon as possible. Now if you've got three healers and two players are getting the debuff on them in 10 man mode, then there should be no issues whatsoever with making sure this is dispelled. Because when the debuff reaches 15 seconds, it splits into two debuffs and goes on to two other players and it will keep on multiplying and going to additional targets. So you need to make sure that this isn't doing this as it's extra damage on your raid and it is quite a bit more damage in heroic mode that you'll have to heal through. And finally the ability that has actually changed in heroic mode is Sun Tenderheart's Calamity ability. Now for every cast of Calamity in heroic mode the next Calamity will deal 10% additional damage, so 10% more of your maximum health in damage every time it is cast. Now this will be reset when she enters her Desperate Measures phase, but you need to keep in mind that the first strike will take 30% of your maximum health, the second strike will take 40%, the third strike will take 50%, and so on and so on. So if that gets to a few strikes, say 4, 5, 6 potentially, you will need to start using raid cooldowns or personal cooldowns in order to make sure you're not dying to the damage. Now something that's going to finally be worth noting is the order that we actually bring the bosses down into their desperate measures phases for. And we chose to do it Rook first, then Sun, then He, then Rook, then He, then Sun. And this is mainly down to the way that Calamity works now and making sure that you're not going to take up too much damage from it overall. Now you want Sun to kind of reset the damage on Calamity earlier on in the fight, which is why we chose to bring her down second after Rook and before He. And then you want to kind of try and build up the Calamity as much as possible, but not to a dangerous standard, so that when you kill her off as the third one to enter the 33% Desperate Measures phase, you've then got the damage being reset for the remainder of the fight where you're going to burn the bosses down. And we found this was kind of easier because with all the abilities still going off, even though there's no more Desperate Measures phase, you've still got 33, 33 and 33% remaining health to burn down on the last, on the bosses. So this is quite a bit of damage as well as, you know, heroic mode bosses have more health, etc, etc. You want to be starting off with as little damage on your raid as possible. And I think just as we we're about to kill them, we had to use a raid wide cooldown or personal cooldowns in order to make sure that the damage wasn't too high on us. 
So that's going to do it for this Mr. Pandaria raiding guide. Hopefully it will get you a kill and epic loot and shiny achievements as previously mentioned. And if you would like to view a written version of this guide, then you can head on over to flaskup.com or click on the link in the video description below. Alternatively, if you'd like to view any of our other heroic mode guides, then please do click on one of the annotations that are on screen now. Thank you for watching, and if you are interested in future Mr. Pandaria raiding guides, then please do feel free to subscribe to the channel.